Welcome back, everybody, to a podcast where two guys talk about the sport of triathlon. It's Talking Triathlon. My name is Tim Ford. I'm joined by James Bale, the sexiest voice in triathlon himself. I was sitting here thinking before I hit record, when I do get my pre-recording anxiety, I'm going to do some little bit about how I walked in and caught you talking triathlon, but I just couldn't be bothered, mate. But how are you going? Yeah, I'm, I'm often talking triathlon to myself <laughs> on my own before you join me. Yeah, I'm not too bad. It's been a it's been a week rich in podcasts, hasn't it? You know, we've done the bonus. We've also, it's not that we've recorded lots, but you and I have been fucking talking a lot. About triathlon. <laughs> about triathlon, haven't we? We, You know, with everything that's happened, transpired in the last sort of uh, week, really, after we'd recorded the normal episode last week. Um, it's been a, there's been a lot of talking triathlon this week, both with you and with many, many, many other people in the sport. I have done so much talking triathlon this week. It's been ridiculous. Uh, we are obviously talking about the, uh, I think the big thing that came up this week was the Sam Laidlow post on Instagram that has since been deleted that, uh, we are going to talk about later. Um, we're probably not going to go to, again, I don't think it's something, it's a tricky one, James. It's a tricky one to comment on. Uh, this is I a tricky one. Eh? We we gave some thoughts on our bonus episode, which we recorded a couple of days ago, where uh, I think we were probably, as we as we tend to do with this show, we were a bit more uh, candid uh, on the bonus. We were as show. candid as we could be within the the, the 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 sort of litigation minefield that might be that topic. Yes, it it is a it is a tricky one, but we are going to talk about that this week. We also have. Uh, a duo of guests this week on the show. We have got Max Stapley and Kate Woff. Kate recently won Super League Triathlon. Uh, and Max is also her, not just a boyfriend, but also a, a very high level professional triathlete himself. You might have heard him on a few episodes of Triathlon Mockery. He gets pretty real, mate. He's uh, he's definitely got some opinions on Maxi, uh, which was, again, quite, you know, quite good. Uh, so we'll get that to that too. But uh, before we get to the little chit chat, uh, this podcast is obviously talking triathlon. Uh, if you enjoy the show, you want to hear what we actually think about what's been going on lately. You can head to patreon.com forward slash talking triathlon. You sign up for $5 a month, get a bonus a monthly podcast. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group, a Facebook group, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. The, the, the episode, again, I was saying to you, I've said it to a few people, actually, I'm getting to the point where I get quite nervous putting out the bonus episodes. Like I'm, I'm sitting there, I've uploaded and I go, should I put this out? Should I release yeah. this? And I, I always think that's probably that's probably a good place to be because it means we're making content that I guess is real. It's not just um, go through the motions. Yes. But... Yeah, the nerves sit, don't they? I'm yet to have my first DM from somebody who's angry that I've said something on the bonus episode, but it is a... Because oh, I get them plenty of times about the regular episodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a nerve-wracking morning. Oh, I get loads about the regular ones. Mm. but uh it's a nerve-wracking morning when we put that up but i do enjoy it i enjoy that hour and hour and a half that we always have we take each month to really lay down what we think about certain things and as you can imagine this week has um has had a heavy topic weighing on the sport so well, we've uh i was thinking to be honest like i reckon that the, before we hit record on this episode is probably one of the long longest pre-podcast chats we've had maybe that's what we need to get in the habit of is just i I should just start the recording as soon as the the zoom call starts and then we just chop out the bit before i say hey guys welcome to talking triathlon and then i edit that together (laughs) every month and that becomes the bonus show because that is probably the most honest we could probably we could save all this faff if we just recorded every phone (laughs) conversation we have in the week and stitch that together we have have to do some serious editing i know but look let's let's get into it because this is obviously a a very delicate topic to to be covering. And I know that probably people expect extreme reaction or extreme response or, uh, I don't know, like a defined position. I'm not sure. But uh, again, for people being, I I am a lawyer and we both work professionally in the sport of triathlon. So I think the the first thing to say is uh, everything we have heard, everything that has been reported at this point is alleged. Uh, I do also understand that they will believe in the presumption of innocence. So I think it's important to say all of that stuff. So everything is just what we're going to try to do is report on what has been reported now. Yeah. Report on what is in the public sphere and then give our opinions on some of those things that have come out into the, into the public sphere and whether we think they are well judged or not, yeah. not what we're not going to do is put our weight behind one element of truth or another. Exactly. We have, no evidence. And I think that that's important. Uh, And I think there's probably also a lot of, I mean, looking at the situation right now, I think there's a bit of confusion, at least in how things are going, because I mean, straight away, I think that 
this has all come down to a leaked email. And I think a lot of weight has been given to that email where I think that that's probably not the catalyst that people think it is. I think that it is probably just simply a, a part of the a part of it, not, not it, but uh, you have got a bit of a timeline for us, I believe Jimbo. So- yeah. Yeah. I mean, the leaked, the leaked email kind of triggered things, didn't it? And it didn't yeah. trigger things in the public because that leaked email was making its way through the sport without really any of the fans or any of the people that watched the sport knowing what triggered things from the sport was everybody woke up one day and Sam Laidlow had posted on Instagram quite an aggressive post both in english and in french and to paraphrase that it kind of said you will not take this away from me today i'm disgusted today i'm saddened i'm being attacked and i'm ready to go to war for the sport i love so dearly some frustrated humans have accused me of cheating the sport and i will not let it be i have poured my heart and soul into my performances and my recent world title i know who i am and I am willing to expose all my past medical exams and blood passport. I've never asked for a TUE in my life, and I've never even touched the grey zone. Some athletes maybe do. No drugs, no needles, no hormones, nothing. And the sport exploded, didn't it? The comments section was on fire. Thousands of comments, a lot of them from other people who were included in the post, because... That wasn't the end of it. He then mm. said that the net, the people listed following this are my enemies. Yeah. And you scroll through and there were a list of people that he was um, he was calling out. People that had been referenced in this leaked email from uh, Rudy von Berg Sr. Mm. Rudolf von Berg Sr. And um, essentially that triggered a series of responses from, from people. Uh, Rudy von Berg has put his own response out. His senior, statement, senior. I, mean, I yeah, think Rudy von Berg I think we senior. need. To, I think we need to keep Rudolf von Berg senior, and then we call Rudy von Berg just to keep the separation. Because yeah, yeah. That's one true. thing I do want to make clear that I think has been quite uh, unfair. Maybe I'm not sure is the right, to, but like Rudy von Berg's not said anything. Has not seen. His dad didn't mention. It. Like I, I understand it's his father, but I do think that one of the things I've looked at this that I think is a, is a bit unfair. Yeah, I think it's the word is the shade Rudy's getting because yeah. Like the sins of your father sort of thing. Like, I I mean, I get it. But like, as far as I can see, Ru- Rudy Jr. has not made any comment, has not come out in any way about this. So, and and again, I just I just think it's worth making that because I, I do think that I've seen a lot of the comments referencing Rudy and it's like, dude, he hasn't done anything. So, And the, the heavy inference on Sam's post was that he was under investigation by the ITA. The ITA have now followed this with their own statement saying uh, it's not for the ITA to comment on the content of, a, of the post by Mr. Laidlaw on Instagram. On a general note, we can confirm that the ITA receives on a regular basis through its confidential reporting platforms, reveals suspicions of doping or alleged anti-doping rule violations across 50 sports that the ITA oversees internationally. We cannot comment on the existence or the status of ongoing investigations, but we would like to assure the triathlon community that all information brought to our attention is meticulously assessed in full independence and always with the interests of the athletes to compete in a fair environment in mind. All allegations must be supported by sufficient variable evidence and free from deliberate tarnish. Otherwise, the presumption of innocence applies. Mm. So that is not a confirmation from them that Sam Laidlow is under investigation per se. It is very lawyer speak if you know what i mean you'll it's know just what that a, means. It's, it's just a generic statement right to say we can either yeah. confirm or deny the existence of x y or z and if or if not yeah it's it's just a it's a, it's copy paste generic statement they've they've chucked in sam Laidlow's name uh it, it's it's just trying to be neutral i mean the other thing is people well, that he named in that post all those enemies per se they have also commented i haven't got their comments in front of me but as this as this kind of snowballed and as you can imagine pressure would have mounted from outside of his own like is pressure from people within his orbit i'm assuming would have mounted sam has now archived that post and then released this statement saying i've archived my recent post concerning the accusations as i want to move on and pursue what needs to be done professionally the reason i exposed this publicly was not to create a hate community against the people who have accused me but to prevent such a defamation from happening again i want people to love this sport and believe that you can get to the highest level with passion and dedication alone now it's interesting that he says that Mm. because first of all i think what we need to as discuss is if you're if you're under investigation for something like this there is a presumption of innocence mm. and there is also a confidentiality to it mm-hmm. and if you are found to be to have not done what people are investigating you to have done 
then that confidentiality will stay in place and nothing will ever be made public. Well, so you, you, you exactly, you go to that, you go to that article that was put out with Andrew Messick, where Andrew Messick literally said, we had top level athletes that we thought we had dead to rights. And exactly. we went to the, the court of arbitrary and he's like, you will never know their names as you shouldn't. And that's exactly that, that, that's, that's your point, right? Is that if you go through this process and you get found innocent, your name will never be mentioned publicly. Nobody will ever come out and say, Hey, we investigated James Bale. Uh, we found him innocent. It, you, you, it would be completely confidential. hundred percent. Correct. I stopped doing blood bags years ago. Uh, being that it was Halloween, I was tempted to, to start the podcast with a blood bag on the wall and a needle stuck into my jumper. Well, you have got or some TVs, good. mate. So <laughs> I know you're a dodgy guy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my 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 on, on the basis of what we've just said, what bemuses me most and bemused me first was why would you make this post and create this if you thought it was going to go away really quickly? If you're as innocent as you say you are, which you know, who knows? then why make this much fuss and this much noise around something that isn't currently public? I mean... It's a strange thing to do, mate. I've... Hundred, that was my, my my overwhelming first thought was like, why the fuck have you done this? Like, yeah. take and it not down, only mate. from Not only from, a, from, a, from a, a looking innocent or looking guilty perspective, but also from this perspective of this is a business. Correct. You have That's, sponsors... Yeah. to look after you have people in the sport that rely on you and what you're doing and if your sponsors look at you and go holy fucking i mean people must have looked at their computers that morning and gone Ugh. yeah i did <laughs> and i'm not a yeah. sponsor but i looked at it and was like oh fuck like i woke up to it because again it, it went up in the middle of the night for me and i woke up my phone was on fire and i was like again same thing i was just like dude like what are you because he's he you know what Again, that innocent, guilty, I don't know. Um, you like this is now a public sort of association, I suppose. Like, if if once there's sort of is like, okay, for the, the lay, the muggle, the, the non obsessed triathlon fan who didn't know this was a thing, they are now going, shit, okay, Sam Laidlow's under investigation for doping. Like, that, that, that is a, that is a line between the two things that I think will, it's sort of there now and it didn't have to be. That's, that's the thing about this that I just, I sit down and I just go, I don't understand why. And I, and look, the other thing we need to accept is Sam is a young man. Like, you know, we're talking about a young man who has suddenly had a lot of attention thrown over onto him over the last 12 months. I know that he has a team around him and I know this team is excellent. He has excellent people around him. And that's also why I'm just so confused by it all, where I just, I just can't, I honestly cannot in my head make sense of this as a, as a, um, no, huh. another another follow up to that, and a follow up to his his um, uh, assertion that he he hadn't put the post up to create hate amongst the people that uh, that he listed there was. I want to I want to reference a, my favorite comment, favorite mm. the comment that I think is most relevant that I saw on his post, which was in where I I'm Lewis Donovan on Instagram put this on. Uh, on Sam's post, it said, "Sam, if you're in support of the ITA and the anti-doping process, why would you post such a post such a volatile public call to arms to get your fans to hate on these people instead of letting the facts speak for themselves? Most of them have only responded to the ITA's questions by saying what they have heard, publicly shaming athletes for speaking to anti-doping authorities and having audits on rumors is exactly the issue and slows down Queen's clean sport. Mm. Exactly." This is, he's acting in the way that Lance Armstrong used to act back in the bad old days where it was attack, 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 attack. I'm clean. I've never, I've never failed a test. Attack, attack. And what that does is it slows down clean sport. It makes mm. people question and hate on those people that are questioning things. Lance Armstrong used to call people out in press conferences, call journalists out in press conferences publicly who were questioning things. And people would get, you know, ostracized from the sport for it. I mean, we've we've copped our fair bit of, of hate because we've said stuff about popular athletes that their fans haven't liked. And it ain't fun. But, you know, we joke about it. But there's been times where, you know, there's been a bit of hate on, on and it's it's not a good time. And you're, you're exactly right. Like, it, 
whether he intended to or not, that post has made, I mean, you've seen it, the, the, the comments about Clement, the comments about Rudy, the comments about Marjolaine. They've not been like, well done, guys. Thanks for speaking up. It's been like, no. you're just jealous. It's because your performance is ungood enough. Like it, that has, that is a very real consequence of this. And that is exactly right. Is that if you're an athlete who is not even talking about Sam now, you, let's say you're, a, you're a, 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 a pro athlete, you've seen something, you want to say something, you've seen this happen. You're thinking, fucking hell, I don't want that heat. And apparently, you and know. A question for you as well. I mean, you'll know more about this than I do when it comes to the, the law. Um, often in, in normal life, if you're under investigation for something, if some if something is going through a process, you're not really allowed to talk about it because it prejudices things. Mm. You know, I would have assumed before this that an athlete under investigation for something like this was probably not allowed to say anything. I don't know if that's true or not, but I would ask you, what do you think? I would assume that this isn't like, this is probably a lot like this is a lot less uh, burdensome than a like a legal process. I would assume this is this is still very much and well, obviously a formal process. If it is happening, it is not a uh, you know there's not a discovery or burn of evidence or anything like that at this no. point. I think it's I think not going to end up with a gag order on him like President Trump's got at the moment. Then <laughs> it look it, it, I could see this you know maybe, so. I don't know how legal I want to get here. There's levels, right? So normally things will start at an investigation. And then if there's a finding, there might be charges. Then there's an appeals process. And then it, so there's there's steps. And I think we're still very early on. But mm. again, like if you've been accused of murder, the, the the victim coming out, making a public statement, saying these people that have you know witnessed and stuff, that, that could be, that could go, you, your lawyer would advise you not to do that sort of thing. Um, yeah, because not only, I mean, like, using trump as an example he's naming people he's naming and shaming judges and people yeah. who are opposed to him and that whips up his little clan into a into a furore and puts them in danger yeah now i'm not saying that that's what sam laidlow's done but i'm just saying i'd have thought it would be sensible not to uh not to be prejudicing things in such a way publicly yeah. But, now back back to the back to the Instagram, which again has been taken down because I only discovered this yesterday, and I, I have to give uh, GTN credit for this. They've done a, a video that I think was quite good about this as well. It was uh, on the slides that he put up. There was the ones in English, and there was some in French. And I had made the assumption that the ones in French were just the English ones in French. Uh, it turns yeah, out. So that, did I. Yeah. It, yeah. it turns out that in fact was not the case because the other thing that Sam makes specific reference of is the Senate Center in Girona. And the fact that a lot of the con controversy is because he goes to this Senate in Girona, even though he doesn't live in Girona. And uh, the Senate Center became popular, or not pop popular is the wrong word, uh, a topic of discussion in the sport because that is where uh, Colin Chartier went. And after Colin Chartier got pinged, it's sort of like by association, is this place dodgy? Th the other thing, again, like, I mean, I find it bizarre, not bizarre, like that he's openly said like why give up that information voluntarily again because suddenly you're going to have all these people i mean maybe it's good pr for them. i don't think it is but a, a lot of people had probably never heard of the senate center and suddenly that's also like if i was yeah. the i mean if, I was if, the, if you uh, didn't already yeah. have the get good by association he does now yeah that's what i mean like if, if if the statements alone were just like these guys have said i'm doing something wrong by the way other people are also saying that the reason they think I'm dirty is because I go to the same sports facility, health center doctor as a convicted dope. Like, again, I don't understand why. Just keep it to yourself. Like, I, that's the biggest thing here. I just, I just don't understand the, 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 uh, giving up of so much information voluntarily. And, and uh, yeah, mate. And but anyway, it doesn't end there because Rudolf von Berg senior has since come out and responded to Sam's, because Sam was quite vicious, I suppose, about, uh, again, whether he intended to or not, about what Rudolph has said about the uh, the emails. Um, what did Rudolph have to say? He's, I won't read it all. I'll, I'll, yeah, don't. I'll pick <laughs> elements of it because it's, it's a <laughs> it's big a... one. Sam laid low. I am not slandering you. You are slandering me and my family by liberally and maliciously choosing to convey the meaning of my private email, which was never meant to be public. A private communication between me and another party is a private business, not yours to do with what you like. My private email and was forwarded by mistake to a third person who shared it with you. It wasn't even addressed to you in private. I can say what I want to whom I want about anyone I want. Thus, I have not attacked nor accused you of anything and don't plan to threaten or and insult you shamefully as you did to others. Um, basically, a load of stuff about um, private emails and lashing out. Um, 
And uh, there's a lot that could be said about your contempt for the old school people, basically all triathletes and coaches over 40, the huge majority of professional triathletes since at World's Nice, you had 50 watts more than them who seem to be frustrated. Athletes with no respect and ethos, thanks on their behalf. A lot also could be said about the Senate Center and a kid that was malnourished and overtrained from 13 to 18 and became the best in the world at 2023. I'm not going to dwell any more on your spiteful message because having a son in the sport, I wouldn't want him to be hurt in any way by ricochet. Triathlon does not need your disdain and hate. Mm. It was a long message. There's a lot more in the middle of it than that. And uh, this was publicly, uh, this was publicly shared. So I'm not sharing anything private. Um, Yeah. I mean, like you say, the idea that this investigation, if there is an investigation, was triggered solely by Rudolph's email. I don't believe it. You don't believe it. Um, and also, it's there's a lot of muck throwing going on now. Mm. You know, this 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 kind of back and forward isn't necessary. I don't think. I don't think it helps things. I I will again. I maybe I'm going out on a bit of a limb here. I need to be careful with my words now, but. I think in the last 12 months, probably more since the Colin Chartier thing happened, I have had that many athletes and people in the sport tell me names of athletes that they believe slash know are dirty. I'm not naming names. I'm not going to name. If it was as simple as I think this person is guilty and sending that to the ITA, the ITA would be doing a lot of investigations at the moment based on what we've heard. I don't think that's the case. I think that there needs to be some sort of burden or or suspicion or or something. So I, I don't know. I still I don't actually know if they're investigating Sam. Right? I'm not. That's I'm not trying to uh, suggest that they are. But what I am saying is, if they are, it's not because of an email. Now I also think Rudolph has been a bit ignorant here, thinking that because it's a private email, he's that's not how it works, Chief. Uh, I am always extremely careful uh, about what I put in writing, knowing that in this day and age, things can be forwarded, screenshotted. Uh, it's not sort of how it works, to be honest. You know, one of the first things the police will do is they'll raid your house and take your computer to access your emails and they don't go, sorry, this is inadmissible because it's a private email. Um, the fact that that email is probably pretty widely spread, spread at this point too. Uh, I, I think there's a few people who have seen that email uh, who have received that email. Um is sort of proof of that and we know that once things are on the internet they're there forever uh yeah it's it's a messy situation and i do not see good things come in as a result of this no i think um i think we're gonna see something happen fairly quickly whether mm. it's a resolution to whatever the res it's going to be a resolution mm. whatever that resolution is we're going to see it happen fairly quickly um that's just a feeling I have. So we'll we'll see how that goes. I will try to say something positive now because one of the concerns we've had on this podcast specifically is that the Colin thing happened and there was outrage and then it went whoosh, quiet. And it's sort of, we've heard the rumblings. There's been fucking guys. I cannot have, there's been so many rumblings this year behind. I, I have, it's 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 constant. It is very good to see this is, and again, I'm I'm not trying to say that it's good that it is about Sam, but it is good that it is still being discussed because as, as uncomfortable it is, as as negative as it must be for Sam at this point in time, I do like that the sport isn't turning a blind eye and just going no. Like that, you can, it seems to me like the sport is trying to forge a pathway forward that is like no, we are not going to be seen as a dirty sport, and and it does still dis, dis, disappoint me when you see the comments which are just like, come on, anybody who doesn't believe there's dope is ignorant, like. I, I am bothered by that response. So to see what looks like an effort from the the sport to try to, you know, forge a pathway forward that is clean is is a positive for me. And and I, I would just say that the people who have these strong emotional if you're if you're a, a fan of Sam, a fan of Claremont, a fan of Marjolaine, there's no point in adding hate or fire. This is a, this is, if, if, like we, as we sort of said, right, in order for the sport that we all love to remain clean, when, when there are actual things happening, it is not the place of us to get like, fuck you, how dare you do this? I understand you can feel that way, but like, we need to always let the process unfold, I suppose. And, and again, there's a process for a reason. If, if Sam, if I don't, again, I don't know if there's an investigation, but if Sam is, is innocent, then allow him to be innocent and that's it. 
just like you know rather than always going emotionally to these things which again mm. makes it do if you are an athlete who is thinking that's what i mean i just i never want us to get to the point where if there's an athlete out there who knows something if you are if you are listening you're a pro athlete and you've seen something i don't want you to be intimidated by the potential backlash to not say something then i think that that is something that as fans of the sport as the as the audience we can't allow it to happen and that is something that we can control we can't control what pro athletes do. We can't control how the ITA does their investigations. We can't We can't control how much they're tested. We can control the reaction we have when something comes out to make sure that it is still yeah. a safe space for athletes to be able public to public opinion forward. is never a safe place to, to litigate these things. Exactly. And I think that's just something we all need to be cognizant of is that we need to, yeah, just again, understand that by having a strong, vicious response, we're not helping things. Uh, again, there's so many times I see things online that I'd love to fucking fire up at and I never do because it's, it's just no. not worth it. Um, no, no. So yeah, that's just the little thing I, I think is sort of, I, I don't have much more to say about this, to be honest, mate. I think that there's- No, no. Talking about the court public opinion, talking about the right way to do things and allowing things to play out in the right way. Yulia Yelestratova, who represented Ukraine at the Olympic Games in 28, 2012, 2016, has been served a five-year ban for the use of EPO. So- the ITA is doing things in the sport, and that came out yesterday. I didn't know that. There you go. So she was she can... uh, the um, ban comes after they found erythropoietin in an out of competition sample after the end pro European Cup in June 2021. Well, see, now I will say something. You can fuck off forever out of the sport. <laughs> I'm happy to say yeah. that after after that process has happened. I'm that's that that like that's something I'm happy to comment on. Right. That, that's that's that... the time where you say go fuck yourself. <clears throat> yeah, fuck off forever. Stay out. Never come back. Um, and and competed in three olympic games presumably dirty yeah and again no good if, if anybody ever i will say the same thing about anybody else who's like again there's no place for me no fucking comeback if you get pinged never come back stay away forever uh i'm quite happy to say that on the record but look let's let's switch gears let's move gears because we have a guest this week and we're already nearly 30 minutes in Jimbo. yes uh guess yes correct uh, we have got uh max stapley and kate woff so I'll drop that interview in with them and we'll be back afterwards. Okay, guys, I am joined by the uh, a new triathlon power couple. Uh, it is Max Stapley and Kate Woff. I've pronounced that correctly, I hope, Kate. Is that it's Kate Woff? Yes, correct. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Now, Kate is the newly crowned Super League Triathlon Series Champ for 2023. And I know that Max played a pivotal role in uh, getting you across the line. Isn't that right, Max? No comment. <laughs> Thank you both for joining us. Uh, again, we are we are here to talk all about triathlon, and I think you guys have had a pretty interesting last few months with races, grand finals, uh, as I said, series champions winning uh, Toulouse, Kate, Max getting a, a five-second penalty for jumping the gun in Neom the other day. How are you both? Uh, yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's been a turbulent year, but it's definitely kind of ended on a bit of a high for me so yeah I'm really pleased with the progress I've made this year uh, yeah yeah I mean same for me up and down uh had a really good period in the middle of the year uh, a bit more complicated in the last couple of weeks <clears throat> I've just come off the back of a lung infection that I just found out was a lung infection so uh antibiotics for a week which hasn't been hasn't been the best but that's just the sport isn't it it's uh it's hard to be uh, hard to be up all the time and uh, that's why we love it, I guess. Just uh, constant excitement. Now, our listeners will be familiar with you both because I think on a previous episode, I was talking about the night out we had after the Mal Malibu uh, Super League race where I may or may not have bought the table like 25 shots of tequila or something. But mm -hmm. I want to start by talking about the Toulouse race Super League for you both because if we talk about a uh, a uh an extreme variation in uh, experience, I think that would have to be it with Kate. You win in the women's race and Max... Uh, what happened to your bike in that race, mate? Because I've seen the photos. Uh, it's uh, split three ways. So <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was I was actually having a pretty good day. To be fair, like I was contesting for a top eight against probably one of the most stacked fields that Super League had ever assembled, and uh, I hundred percent my fault. I was chasing a, a group of three in front of me. Uh, I had Seth Ryder, Sanchez, Hauser, and. Uh, that's about it on my wheel. I uh, went through a corner in one of the technical sections and just was a bit too fast coming in, too much exit speed, put it in the barrier, over the bars, 
and four guys ramming into my bike, which resulted in uh, me being bikeless for a few days. But, uh, you know, that's the game. I mean, highest of highs, lowest of lows. Like, I, I can still take positives away from my performance before that crash. But, uh, yeah, it's tight margins. I think somebody was saying like seven crashes in our men's race. No, just because I, do, I just think it's just so tight and everyone's just willing to literally crash or you know not lose a position and and, and crash so uh yeah it is what it is and then for you kate winning winning your first your first super league win i believe that was it because you, you podiumed in you podiumed in london and then you won in toulouse is that right or f is that right i was fifth, I was fifth in london oh, that's close okay I, there were so many sharks on the front of that race i i got you all confused <laughs> so you, you obviously then had your first win in toulouse what was that like yeah, yeah, it was really special. Uh, Toulouse is definitely one of my favourite races. So it's like a packed course. Uh, my parents were there as well. So, yeah, I I went into it thinking I could probably podium if things went well. And then kind of within the first uh, lap of the first round of the bike, I had a pretty big gap and, yeah, um, managed to kind of maintain it from there so yeah it was a really good day it was a really good day until obviously I watched Max and then kind of uh, my heart sank a bit when I did see him coming around the corner uh, and I didn't know what kind of state he would be in when he got up off the floor so um, pretty scary moment actually so thank you for bringing me back down to earth very quickly uh <laughs> there is there is a story I'd love to because on um uh, Max was on triathlon mockery a few weeks and he was telling the story about how when you were uh, running your way to the podium in Pontevedra, he actually got accosted by security and almost arrested. How how aware how aware were you of this? And when you found out what had happened, what was your was it like? How dare they do this to my boyfriend? Or fucking hell, stop embarrassing me! Like, what are you doing? What was your reaction to this? I I honestly wasn't even shocked by it. I was like, that's just the most max thing. To happen. <laughs> I have these situations that just tend to kind of happen to me, despite my best my best in like despite my best me trying my best to not have these things happen but they just seem to happen so i guess that's just uh that's just me like wherever i go this seems to just be something happened but i remember you were telling us all at the same time what had happened and everyone's like oh wow what that happened and i was just like yeah i'm not i'm not even <laughs> i don't think she, I, I, I just i don't at the start i don't think she believed me she's like yeah yeah of course you got arrested and then like pro try news did that post was like wanted max stably crash tackled by five security guards and that like literally it was ridiculous, man. Like, there's no way that reaction was 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 warranted. Like, but of course, obviously it was me. So, nearly got bloody locked up by the Guardia Seville for going and celebrating your girlfriend. But whatever, it is what it is. It was a like, like I sort of touched on it. It has been a a year for you, Kate. I mean, you know, we look at the the under twenty three world championship. You know, you've you've had the you know, the, the second place in the grand final, Super League series win, uh, Super League overall championship win what's the what's your experience like you know we all you know success is fantastic and some of the little athletes try but you're you're living at the moment you're in that point in your career when you're starting to actually see the success come what's that been like what what is uh, i'm so fascinated by like obviously the performance is great and you know going fast is fantastic but like what's it being you going through this we'll call it a transition at the moment like what's it like what are you, what are you noticing differences like i'm just i'm fascinated by by how your mind is changing as a result of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely been like a little bit overwhelming. Uh, like, obviously, I kind of always thought I could kind of reach the top of the sport if I worked hard, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, and then I got the second in Pontevedra and I don't think I slept for like three weeks afterwards. Like, I, I was like, I was just, I just had so much kind of nervous energy. I had like kind of a lot more like, people kind of messaging me every day and I was getting kind of a bit overwhelmed with like suddenly uh being I don't know being noticed and recognized like not obviously like not in the street or anything I mean like um come on you're being shy surely you're walking down the street in I just felt like I'd worded that really bad <laughs> Um, I felt like I was looking with bloody posh Beckham, just like, you know, <laughs> but like, no, what I was going to say is I I also had like the worst three weeks of training after Pontevedra because I was just like, I was so tired. Like, I think I definitely like was on a huge high after Pontevedra. And then 
we obviously did the huge travel to Malibu and I didn't have the race I wanted and we both picked up a bit of a virus um because we were pretty run down and I had like the worst couple of weeks of training and I was like super nervous going into Neom because I was like I've definitely just thrown away this title because of my nervousness and um anxiety around kind of this race so yeah to then go and get like to win the championship series and super league was like even more kind of overwhelming because I honestly like didn't expect to do that so yeah. That's see that's fascinating to me because we we're talking about you've just had this you know incredible result you you know you're not that you don't believe it but it's you know second place in the grand final and you'd assume right that I mean I would assume that there'd be a confidence that would come with that like on the on the world's biggest stage I've just come second and you're actually saying that as a result of that there was increased nerves and almost more anxiety and pressure as like, that that's fascinating do you think it is it is it purely because of is it because you had disruption to your routine or was it maybe because suddenly you felt more pressure like what what particularly was it that you think caused this i guess negative not negativity but i get like anxiety or whatever it is uh i think it was like it's just like a emotional roller coaster you ride like after a big race like um I obviously had like coaches and family in Ponte Vedra so I got to share that experience with them and I was on a huge high and then we did kind of the long travel to Malibu and I had like a very kind of below average race there so then like reality kind of hit me and I kind of felt like I was came crashing back down again so um yeah I, I definitely kind of rode a very big wave um after Ponte Vedra and yeah I guess kind of people had mentioned to me oh yeah you know you're capable of winning the Super League series like do you know that and I'm like yeah I know that like but nothing's going right now and uh yeah we obviously were both ill and that was kind of stressing me out and uh so yeah I guess um it was kind of more that like I feel like I had like an expectation of how I should perform then whereas all the rest of the year I've been a bit of an underdog and I've kind of I've not felt any pressure as a result of that and then going into Neom I was like oh like people kind of expect me to do well now so uh yeah Thanks. I guess that's what... you <laughs> I mean you can be honest has she changed has it changed her has success gone to a head mate is she is she a real diva now or <laughs> Was, wasn't she already? <laughs> uh, no, I uh, I think for me, it's been a bit like underwhelming in a sense. Like, I guess I've had so many people come up to me like, oh, wow, you know, amazing, whatever. But when you live with someone on a daily basis and you know them intrinsically and you you see them train, you see them eat, you see them recover, you, you know their talent, you know their mindset. I mean, it would be arrogant for me to sit back and be like, oh, I'm not surprised. But like, there's a part of me that's like was expecting it. Like it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when, but I think the decisions that we both made this year to put ourselves in the environment that we currently are, to put ourselves uh, with the squad that we currently are to, to, to base ourselves in the locations that we did the best training locations in the world, in my opinion, um, and to eat properly, to sleep properly, to, to take things just that bit more seriously when you have someone as talented as Kate is like, and who in my opinion, hadn't really uh, trained properly ever for triathlon and to put herself in a, in a position where she's with the world's best. It's kind of what you get really, isn't it? You get performance. So um, of course, again, not saying I was expecting it, but to see her running the way I knew she could run and the way I'd seen she could run in sessions was I guess just a bit of a relief because you tell yourself, well, you know, I wasn't totally crazy to think that this girl could, could compete with the very best. We also like, it's not like you, you know, obviously we're talking a lot about Kate right now because she's just had the, the super league, but you've, you've had a pretty good year too, mate. We were talking before we hit record, right? This has been your most successful year, you know, the Olympics next year. How, how are things looking from you professionally? Yeah. I mean, of course, like ups and downs, we spoke about the crash and to lose and stuff. And the start of the year really was really difficult. I had a really good winter uh most consistent good running no injuries no interruptions um but i just, just couldn't seem to get it right i would always have something happen whether or not that was my fault or not sometimes like i, I crashed twice really heavily at the start of the year so in a french grand prix i went flying over the bars completely tore myself to shreds uh three weeks later in madrid i managed to kind of get myself back mentally and physically to a position where i could compete for a top 10 
was in the front group after a really quick first 5k and was taken out by a fellow competitor at the front of the group, which is insane to me because something I couldn't really fathom after the race was I was doing everything right at the time and I still got taken out and I was on the deck cut up again. And it was, it was tough to pick myself up from there. But then from then I had, you know, a top 10 finish at a French Grand Prix, which was extremely stacked. I think there was like four of the top eight guys in the world racing went 12th at Tizzy, uh, then podiums at world series relay podiums at world cup, top five at super league. And things just seemed to kind of, to kind of go well. So all those results kind of spanning from the FGP. So those five results from the FGP to the super league were just, um, were just kind of a confirmation of the work I'd done and a, and a confirmation of, like validation of, of the decisions we've made similarly so, yeah. similarly then to what what kate was sort of saying do you find that with the improved results are you are you feeling more pressure more expectation or is it like are you feeling more confidence like what 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 is the success doing for you as an athlete uh i think i don't yet feel that pressure because i don't think the results even though despite they've been good aren't quite at the point where you're like at the pointy end of a world series which is the cream of the crop and even if I, I'd like to think if I had those results, I would just take that as a, I know I can run with these guys now, or I know I can compete with these guys, but yeah, no, I, I, I think I take that success and I think, right. Okay. We've done, you've done that. Like you can do better or you can keep doing that consistently, or you can keep climbing the ladder, so to speak. And it just excites me. Like I, I get a real buzz off, off, um, off doing well. And I think everyone does. And it's something that if you could bottle it and sell it, you'd be a billionaire, that kind of feeling of, of, crossing the line and having had a good race and everything seems to be like it genuinely is it genuinely is a state of pure euphoria that you for me i've never found in anything like i've you know i've gone down descents like as fast as i can i've surfed big waves i've done all the stuff that kind of like other people do for a thrill and like they're good thrills but that thrill of crossing the line knowing you've left everything out there and you've come away with the result and you've surprised yourself is like you get it your whole body kind of just flushes up to your neck and i don't know for me at least and 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 it's such a good feeling so i've kind of gone on gone away on a tangent but yeah i guess i i take more confidence from knowing i'm able to compete you know when you're at super league running behind johnny and alex you think well i can do it it's just a, just a question of doing it more regularly now hey you, you you talked about how you felt after your second place in pontevedra and you know you didn't sleep for weeks and it was like if that's second place can you imagine what first place would be like do you do you think that it would be like do you expect it to be the same do you think it'd be like uh exponentially different like can you comprehend how much better it must feel to win or like do you like i, I i'm curious around that like what do you think if you felt so good after second what do you think first would be like i think to be honest that second place like it did feel like a win uh in so many ways for me it felt like i kind of everything I'd worked towards since I like started triathlon when I was eight years old uh was kind of finally starting to kind of like all that kind of work I put in was like finally like starting to show for something and I I think it would be a very similar feeling to be honest because yeah like I said it did feel like a win that day and uh yeah I mean I ran at the front of a world series for uh seven and a half k eight k so um yeah it was like i i felt i felt like almost invincible even though i did get beaten that day i did feel unbeatable um and yeah i mean i guess i'll keep working towards like being on the top of the podium um next time but i think it'd be a pretty similar feeling for sure i've actually got a got got an unpopular opinion about kate this year okay i feel like no, no, and I don't know if Kate will agree and you will agree, but I feel like that top five in Yokohama for me, I just sat back and went, "All right, she's good," you know, because you just changed groups, you done a winter where you weren't like, you know, you're still kind of thinking, "Oh, is this the right thing?" And then bang, you go and knock out a top five Olympic distance. I was just like, okay, like it's just gonna, it's just gonna roll, and it did. So I'm glad it did. <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon i woke up and saw that result and i was like jesus christ like, remember how it was like yeah it's true. top five yeah standard distance world series yeah i think like whatever is like a first it always feels like you're on top of the world like it was my first top five in yokohama and it was my first podium in pontevedra like 
it's like what Max talked about, like the kind of euphoria you feel of like getting to a point you always kind of thought you might be capable of is like, yeah, is a feeling that you can't really match. Yeah. And I also think that's why you have such massive lows because you know that at the start of every race, that feeling is like only an hour away or two hours away and you don't get it. You kind of like the inverse effect of that is horrific. You're like, you feel like shit, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you feel like everyone around you knows you've had a crap result and you, your self-worth is kind of tarnished. And, and, and cause you know that on the flip side, if you'd only done this and this, or if you'd done this different, or if you felt a bit better or whatever, you could have had that feeling again. And I think that's why you see people often in the sport, you're like, why is this guy still going? Or why is this girl still going? But I think because that feeling of success is so addictive that once you get it a few times and once, you know, you look at people that are still going like Alistair and people, are, Oh, why is Alistair still doing, you know, he's achieved everything he needs to achieve or Gomez, like, he's achieved everything, whatever, or yarn or whatever, because that feeling of winning or doing well is so addictive. unique, addictive that they just, you just can't stop. And I can, I can relate to that, I guess, in a way. That's, I love that idea, actually. That, that, that does makes a lot of sense because yeah, there has been a few where you, you do sort of go, Oh, why are they still doing it? You, you talk about sort of, Sorry? Sorry, I was gonna say you guys have spoken like, about. Said, like, oh, you got so much money, whatever. Like you could just stop, and people are like, oh, he's got the money, he's got the sponsors, he's got the whatever. But you can't buy that feeling of winning a race, or you can't buy that feeling of even just like a top five where you didn't think you could do it. Or, and I think I genuinely think like now looking back, especially on the year that I've had, where it's kind of gone like that. Like that's why people keep going is because it's just so like you cannot replicate it. I've always said the thing that keeps me going, and obviously I'm not racing for world titles, but I, I love the, I always feel like triathlon as a sport is like you're trying to solve a Rubik's cube to get that perfect performance, but it's proactively trying to undo like all the work you've done to, to get the Rubik's cube right. It's almost always working against you because you think you've worked out one thing and then a new thing pops up and then you get that worked out and then a new thing pops up. And I, I love, I love the, the, the process of that, right? Is that it's always, you've never got it perfect. Even even those people that have had those perfect performances, those perfect days, there's still always that one. Oh, if I had just done this a bit different, if I had have done this, or next time I'll do this. And personally, I love that. Like that's what keeps me going. Is just that like it's it's just a constantly evolving riddle that I'm trying to get right. And it it, it is. It's it's something that I really love about it. Uh, you were talking about how you sort of made some changes at the start of the year uh, to your approach to the sport. Be more, I guess we'll call it more professional. Maybe that's not the right word, but. Like, tell me about that process. Like, is it a, is it a sit down conversation between the two of you and go, look, we need to, we need to make some changes or like, how did that decision happen? And, and sort of what were those changes that you, you, you made? Like, what are the, I guess the, the main things you started to do differently? Well, um, so last year, well, I've been based in, I was based in Leeds for five years. Uh, I was studying there and I was part of the Leeds kind of performance center there uh and kind of for the last 18 months that I was there I started to feel like I was in a bit of a rut like I just wasn't really enjoying training I wasn't really enjoying kind of like anything about triathlon anymore um and obviously I had like a, a couple good results but like it wasn't really do like doing anything for me because I think I just like I wasn't too happy in like everyday life and then um Max and I started dating back in 2021 and he yeah, Bradley looks of himself by the way he just it's like yeah we did <laughs> <laughs> you did uh... do that too it's on video so people are gonna see that <laughs> yeah, well, it is what it is <laughs> sorry um... I interrupted you he did look very smug then though <laughs> and uh he he did it he as a as a guy who grew up in Australia he moved to Leeds and did his first winter in Leeds which um I think I nearly saw him break down no thank you <laughs> several times I literally I felt like I turned my boyfriend into a shell of a human after that winter so um like honestly it was like difficult to watch um so yeah I think we kind of got towards the end of the year and we were like look like we need to make some changes like for the sake of our kind of happiness and well-being like we just need to do something different and then um we got offered a we basically got offered a place in this yeah. in the squad of um Paulo Sousa Dr Paulo Sousa he would like me to say um so yeah and then we we 
kind of upped and moved within two weeks like we got offered the place in the squad and then it was like okay I packed up my flat in Leeds we got ourselves on a plane to uh, Monte Gordo in Portugal and uh, yeah and then we we were all in with the squad from from there so that was like the biggest change we made this year and uh, yeah seems to have paid off so far. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can. I, I, my wife's Norwegian, and I did two years in Norway. And I think, yeah, that first six months of winter, I just was like, I love you, but this is some bullshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, mate, I, I feel you as a somebody who grew up in Australia. Yeah, I can imagine that. The... I, just, I think there were a lot of things that had changed, like from when I first got there to where it was twelve months later. Like, I think a lot of people had left. Obviously, Alistair and Johnny are training in a different squad uh you never really get to train with them you know xyz and it's kind of like i got to the point where i was going to be the lead athlete at 23 in a performance center i just thought to myself like that's not the position i want to be in like i don't want to be the one leading because i still need to be led type type of thing because i'm not i'm not that experienced i don't have that many results i don't have that much despite the fact i am older and have more results than other people here i don't I, that's not the position I want to be in. I want someone to tell me like, this is what you need to do to progress. This is how we're going to do it. And this is where we're going. And I think that's what I got from Paula. And I think that's what Kate got from Paula as well. And, um, and yeah, I think I just got to a point, like even in terms of the weather, like I'm not from there. I, I've never really lived. I lived a year and a half in the UK and I kind of just, it was one day like preparing for worlds in Abu Dhabi. It was like, we're on this ride on this like 90 minute loop. We do every freaking Monday. And, um, it was must have been like October 25th or something, two weeks out from the race. And all the Germans were in like Mauritius or I don't know where they were training, Lanzarote. Uh, the French were in Abu Dhabi. And I was just seeing on Instagram and I was like, I was riding in minus two in snow. And I got off my bike and I threw it in a field. And I was like, F this, you know, like this is just not worth it. Like this is just ridiculous. Like, yeah. So I got six that world champs. So it was a pretty good result. And, uh, and yeah, like Kate said, we got the offer and and I just, I didn't really see any tangible benefit of freezing my balls off again. So I just thought, okay. But that was, all, that was always something I really struggled with in Leeds. And I don't, please don't hate on me, anyone who's listening to this, but I just, I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get why people made themselves suffer in the cold all winter. Like it's, it's not necessary to be a successful athlete. Like you don't have to freeze your balls off yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a whole winter like it's it's like you get ill so you miss training because of illness you're more prone to injuries like i, I like could like crashing I could, every two weeks and i could never get my head around it I and am. i think that's why over the years of being in leeds i just like more and more was like what am i doing yeah i am um, I, I, yeah. don't get me wrong like it was like the squad at its peak was like like the best athletes in the world and like it was a high performance center but just it being in leeds like <laughs> wasn't for me <laughs> i um i spent a few weeks a few a few days in norwich with joe skipper um after knees and he was so excited to take me to this pool to swim at and i remember he's like oh tell me what you think about this pool i was like oh okay like i'm excited to see what this pool is and we get there and like i remember walking in it was like you know nice change room like quite fancy and we walk up on this pool deck and it's this indoor 25 meter pool and it stunk like chemicals and it was super, I couldn't even do tumble turns because it was like barely up to my waist at one end of the pool. And I've done this, this three K set with Joe and he's like, Oh, what did you think about the pool? And I looked at him. I said, mate, this is fucking awful. He's like, what do you, what do you mean? I said, this has got to be one of the worst pools I've ever swum in. He's like, this is the, this is a great pool for the UK. I said, well, I understand why you're such a shit swimmer then because I wouldn't want to spend any time in this pool either. And I, I, yeah, he's like, I think Australians may actually probably we're spoiled for, for like the training and things like that. But yeah, I, I completely understand that. I think UK is nice to visit, but I couldn't be doing a winter there, especially training for triathlon. I think it would, yeah, I, I wouldn't have kept doing the sport as long as I did if I had to do that. But... I mean, you look every way in Australia and there's an outdoor 50 meter pool. Yeah. Uh, I just had a new one yeah, open like two weeks ago, brand new, brand new 50 meter pool less than a kilometer away from my place and i've been loving training there since it's it's very good uh but anyway uh the next thing i wanted to touch on with you guys because we are in a pre-olympic year uh team gb did very well at the last olympics and we are expecting them to do good things at the olympics next year 
what are you looking at? How much communication have you had with uh, Team GB? What do you think your prospects are for being in Paris on the start line? Uh, do you want me to? Oh, you're the star. Come on. Uh, well, I guess I didn't hit the automatic criteria that British Triathlon had set out. So um, at the moment, like it's kind of, there's a few of us going for the last two places. Obviously, Beth Potter hit the automatic criteria by winning both Paris and Pontevedra. So she's secured her spot on the team. Um, and then... Yeah, it's kind of just like up to discretionary selection. And I think they'll probably uh, choose their final athletes, like not choose them until like uh, the final hour um, of the Olympic selection window. So when's that? Uh, May. I think it's May, end of May. And the race is July, June, August? Is it? Or was it June? Say that on the podcast. August. Is it August? So you're only given a few months to, so you you potentially will only have a few months knowing that you're racing the Olympics. So you have to basically prepare for a race that you may not even be selected for. That's, that's. Race ready. <laughs> that's peak in May for a race in August. Okay. Yeah. So like we, yeah, um, we're going to have to be competitive in May because like, obviously I'm competing against uh, like, some of the best girls in the world um on in gb to compete for these spots so yeah it's like a, it's a bit of a frustrating position to be in because i've always seen myself as um a championship racer and being able to peak for the right races and so there's gonna have to be a double peak in the air i guess uh so yeah <laughs> i mean it's frustrating but at the end of the day i didn't hit the automatic criteria and that's the position we're all in um, with, as with the with the discretionary spots, though, like again, I'm I'm just curious. Like I know I don't mean to criticize, but like, are they? Do they give you any indication? Are they say you might not have met the automatics, but they sort of have informal uh, criteria, or is it just like you have no idea what's going on in there and you won't find out until they make the decision? Like, how much communication do you guys get from them about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've had quite a bit of a communication. You can find like all the selection policies like online. It's all kind of there for anyone to read, but um brit try specifically look at your olympic distance races um so i'm definitely in a difficult position because obviously sophie caldwell won yokohama this year which was an olympic distance georgia taylor brown won cagliari olympic distance this year and she's also the reigning olympic silver medalist and then i obviously came second at the grand final so um yeah the the competition's fierce um and yeah, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be hard and there's definitely going to be in the women's side, there's going to be definitely some heartbreak. So uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to just do everything I can to be competitive in May to like put my name in the hat during the last discretionary selections and uh, basically cross my fingers from there because then it's out of my control. How about for you, Max? Uh, I mean, for us in the men, it's a bit different. We will only have two spots at this stage, and I, I'd be very surprised if we managed to get a third, simply because of the mass of everyone else racing, and we have to be in the top 30, and uh, etc. I mean, I'm not fully across the mass. All I know is it's very difficult, and the results required to get in the top 30 from Barkley, who's currently, or Barkley, who's currently third, or Johnny, who's currently third, is going to be like a very tall order. Uh, so assuming we've only got two, Alex has already got one because he's hit the criteria being a previous medalist and meddling in Paris. Uh, that final spot is completely open in terms of discretion. And uh, for me, realistically, it, it's just going to come through showing my relay ability, whether or not I'm able to be a good third, third relay or first relay, depending on how, what order they want. And uh, honestly, I just, I think being able to assist Alex to win gold because we've seen him win in the test event. And, uh, and I was already, I already did that in Pontevedra. I sacrificed my race to, to help Alex. Um, so whether or not that's a path they choose to go down, that would be, I would potentially be open to doing that. Um, and also, I mean, at the same time, simultaneously working on my relay ability to be able to ensure as good of a performance as anybody else can deliver on that leg. So 
Um, that is my way to the games, despite obviously, again, as Kate said, in the women's, there being stiff opposition in the men's with Johnny Brownlee, an absolute <clears throat> legend. I mean, no question about it. Um, and Barkley Azad, who's had a good year as well. So um, let's see how things evolve. But for me, it seems like a bit of a long shot, but that doesn't mean it isn't a shot. So we'll try our best. I mean, you, you talk a little bit, I guess you're talking about that domestique sort of role. I was talking to Hayden about this a couple of weeks ago, actually. Like, is that a, are these conversations being had? Are they talking? Like, is it is that something they discuss with you, or is it is this you very much? Like, let's look at Pontevedra where you drop back to sort of assist Alex. Is that you just doing it off this, off, you know, of your own initiative, or are, are they sort of being like, oh, if, if Alex is struggling, maybe drop? Like, I, I don't know. Is is that a conversation that's been had with British triathlon? Uh, I thought that that was a conversation that was going to be had the day before. I was expecting it, like. Because obviously Alex was in the running for the title, the maths looked in his favor, um, and and it just kind of made sense. Like I wasn't expecting to be in Pontevedra. I I hadn't hit the criteria for it, and I hit it. I hadn't had the ranking for it, and I did. And I was just kind of there, like, oh, okay, lol. Like I'm here. <laughs> uh, and the night before the race, I twisted my ankle, <laughs> so I was like icing my ankle in the briefing, and I was just like, oh. This is ridiculous. And I just fully expected someone to just say, look, mate, you know, like, obviously you're pretty compromised. Um, if you want to lend a helping hand, that would be greatly appreciated, obviously, because we knew there was going to be the French Armada at the front, uh, which there was in the end, uh, mm -hmm. and potentially Hayden uh, somewhere in the mix. Um, but no, that conversation never came. So I was a bit surprised. Uh, so what happened was basically I was like third last onto the pontoon, had a crappy swim by my standards came out like 30 seconds down kind of hobbled my way to t1 uh missed the i was and then missed the front group so hayden came past me got on his wheel for a lap i kind of you know just kind of getting my bearings like i had decent legs on the bike and i was just like looking around i was like right well alex will be here any moment now you know like and i'll just kind of make sure he's he's good and i just like looking over my shoulder thinking where the fuck is this guy you know like where is this guy and I kind of yell, yelled at like a point on the course where we went up a highway uh, and uh, to one of the staff members saying like, where is he? And they were like, he's 30 seconds down off your group. And we were already in the chase group. And I was like, damn, mm. like, and I just yelled back at him, like, I'm just going to wait. And they were like, yeah, 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 wait. And I was like, all right, a bit late now, you know what so I mean? So that's the conversation. <laughs> yeah, that was the conversation. <laughs> Mid race at 45k an hour. Um, so hit the anchors freewheeled for what felt like an eternity and eventually his small group kind of caught up and i just absolutely murdered myself for seven laps i think i pushed something like the highest power i'd ever pushed over an hour it was like 385 normalized spent like 17 minutes above 455 watts but we lost so much flipping time mate Jesus. so uh, yeah it was a grim day it was grim from a personal level because of the, like I didn't race for myself and was kind of injured in the process. And it was grim from a collective point of view because absolutely no one got the result they were after. Like Johnny didn't get the result he wanted. Barkley didn't get the result we wanted. And especially Alex was miles off the result he wanted. So yeah, it was a bit of a depressing day in the male contingent for sure. Now I know you're both in the thick of short course race inside. I'm going to, I don't expect you necessarily to verbalize everything, but we've seen a lot of development in professional racing happening at the moment in middle and long course racing. We've got the PTO uh, announced their series in conjunction with world triathlon next year. We've seen the Ironman pro series that takes up 70.3 and iron distance racing. Is it like looking in from in within the world triathlon ecosystem, which in my opinion seems to be going a bit backwards in terms of the broadcast is getting worse. We're seeing less commercial opportunities. seems like less events are happening or it's, they're struggling to find the venues. Is it is it sort of hard to be on the outside of this all this happening or seeing all this happening, I guess, over the other side of the fence and like going, yeah, the grass maybe is a bit green over at the moment. Like what what for you guys as short course athletes looking at what's happening in the middle and long course, like what's it like to see that and not really be part of it? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not gonna pull any punches. Like at the end of the day, a lot of short course triathletes won't say what they're really thinking because you are kind of at the mercy of world, of world triathlon to go to the Olympics. That's the basis of it. Like you want to go to the Olympics, you race world triathlon. You want to make money, you go to Super League, you go to PTO, you go French Grand Prix, whatever. 
it is depressing. Like I've spent my whole life looking at World Series thinking, wow, you know, like I remember growing up, Ryan Bailey, Aaron Royal, Brownlee, Brownlee Gomez, all those guys thinking like one day, one day. And I finally did it this year. I got to Sunderland. I got to Ponte Vedra and you sit back and think, is this it? Yeah. Is this really it? You know, and it is it, you know, and you just think I'm, I'm, I'm killing myself 28, 30 hours a week to race on a pay-per-view broadcast. Like, who do we think we are? The UFC? Like, who's going to pay for that? Mm. Okay. The terrible shaky camera, com shaky camera, blurry, you know, coverage. It's horrific. Then the prize money hasn't evolved since 2009, I think. And mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, yeah, but we spread it, spread it further down the field. If you look at inflation, right, 20, it's 18,500 to win. It was 20,000 to win in 2013. I've done the maths. 20,000 to win in 2013 is the equivalent of $26,000 today. $18,000 to win today is the equivalent of $14,000 in 2003, uh, 2013. Therefore, you are under earning $14,000 $14, for a win. That's the state of the economics of World Triathlon. So they can say, oh, yeah, we're doing this for the athletes, blah, 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 athlete-led. And I know there's people that work very hard. There's like Courtney from the media team, people at federations, inside the federations that are really passionate about their jobs. And I'm not taking a shit on everyone here. I'm really thanking them for their, for their work. And, you know, within British Triathlon, we're super supported at a race. We're the best. We're like Mercedes. You know, you get everything done. Like I'm really, really thankful to everyone. But the objective fact reality is a short course triathlon is in trouble mm. it's in trouble from an athlete perspective it's trouble from a viewership perspective it's trouble from a sponsorship perspective you talk to any sponsor the first question is do you do pto and that's depressing because you kill yourself i know these guys and these girls they everyone is so good everyone trains so hard it's you know and that's what you get 700 bucks for seventh the test event what are we doing? Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I know, I know this is probably going to get picked up and people are going to be like, oh, this guy, whatever. But would you race for 700 bucks? Would you kill yourself 28 hours a week for 700 bucks? Would you pay for your own travel, for your own this, for your own that for 700 bucks? And that's assuming you get seven. <laughs> if you get, if you get 16, you get an out, mate. <clears throat> so I know I'm probably going to get cancelled for saying that, but like, I can tell you for a fact, anyone that's awake thinks that. And I don't care anymore. I mean, I get that. I've been quite vocal about, that. I guess the exact same things you're talking about is that it's very frustrating for me where, what I think is probably the highest standard of the sport. There's so many restrictions around what you guys can and can't do. And it is all based around this idea of the Olympics. Like it's almost used against you. And I, and I, and I just, I, I can't, Again, I'm probably going to get, I just can't understand how this is seen as sustainable when it's all it does really is create this reliance on the federations. And we've had so many reports in recent times of the federations doing the wrong thing by their athletes. And it's just, it, again, as an agent, I work professionally in the sport and I just see it and go, I can't understand. I still think there's so much opportunity in short course. If we just separate the governing body from the actual race organizing body and, and go, you know what, let's, let's open this up to commercial opportunity rather than go, no, you need to race for your country and you need to wear the national team kit that the sponsor is provided by the federation. And you can only have two spots on the sponsor on the kit that's worth nothing. Like it has no value for sponsors. Like it, it, it's, yeah, I could, I could also, I didn't mean to start ranting, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I feel you, mate. I think that this is a frustration that anybody who's listening, who is involved uh, professionally, either as an athlete or works in the sport will be feeling uh, your frustrations as well. It's, uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, the other thing as well, and again, I don't want to talk specifics just because of the things that have been happening lately, but I do ask everybody who comes on the show, you guys are professionals. You, you, you know, you spend time with your peers, you guys talk, you know, I, I hear rumors all the time as well, but it's been a rough year for triathlon. There's been a series of negative uh, things that have come up. We've had the Colin Chartier doping incident. We've had deaths in Hamburg. Uh, you know, we've, we've had, personally, I think the sport's not in the best position at the moment. I think it's been quite a rough period, but as professional athletes racing, uh, you know, with your peers and stuff, what is the feeling? What is the mood in the sport at the moment with you guys? Like how, how, when you guys are sitting around after a race and having a, you know, a non-alcoholic beer, what's the, what's the, what's the mood like? Like, are you guys optimistic or, you know, what, what's the feeling? Uh, 
You want the real? You want the real answer? <laughs> yeah, come on. Look, I don't care. Like at the end of the day, I'll say it as it is. I think we're racing a lot more people than we think are dirty. If that makes sense. I think if you look at some people's progressions, if you look at some people's body types, some people's just their demeanor, uh, the way they race, their, their, their kind of career progression, it does not make sense. And I think the fact that the ITA, I've spoke about it on Mockery, we're at the, we're in Ponte Vedra uh, and you get, a you know, Colin, he's not the only one, man. You think he's the only one on EPO? Absolutely not. This guy, like was nowhere near. He won US. You won the US Open, but he got dicked in Kona. You know, he, he was nowhere in other races, and that doesn't mean you can't be successful clean. We're both clean. Like I live with Kate, she lives with me. She's the only person I can say 100% is clean, and I think vice versa. But I think it's very, very naive to think that every other sport we're comprised of the three biggest doping sports in the world: swimming, filthy, cycling, filthy, running. Filthy, and you put them together and we're clean. Give me a break. And also, during COVID, you saw people change their weights and all this stuff to win amateur C grade Zwift races. We're racing for, you know, potentially if you do well, a lot of money. Ooh. And you tell me if we're going to do that, Natty? That's that's probably an interesting way to sort of link up what we were just talking about because we have seen in recent years there has been this influx of capital. We've got more big prize money events, the PTO, uh, Super League, even like. Do you think that's a, is this something that's always been a problem? Or do you think that the, you know, it, as you're saying, if you're, if you're racing for $700, there's probably not going to be as big of an incentive to try to, you know, push the limits where do you think that because we're seeing more money in the sport now, that's what's caused? Like, is it a chicken egg? Is it just always existed? Is it becoming more prevalent because of this? Like, what do you think is, what's the correlation? Go on. <laughs> I'm giving Max all the hard questions. <laughs> no, I mean, look. Like, like, I, I, like, I feel like I take, I think men and women's triathlon is like kind of different. I think, I don't know, maybe I'm completely naive in saying this, but I think that the women's is a lot cleaner than the men's. Um, and I could be completely naive, but uh, I think I've kind of. But sorry, up. just let me let me stop you there. Is it is it about being naive now, or is that something that you need to tell yourself in order to keep stay motivated to train and push? Because if you start going, I mean, what's it like? I mean, Max, you you've just sort of said you think it's 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 dirty, but for you, Kate, you say no, I choose to believe it isn't. Is that because if you suddenly start to accept or allow yourself to think that maybe it isn't, does that suddenly cause you issues around motivation to train, or does it make you start to go, well, what's the point of pushing? Like, do you almost need to? And I'm not saying you don't think it, but is it almost you need to be optimistic about the state of sport in order to continue to to kill yourself for it. Like, is, is that part of it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you just uh, said it really well there. Like, I, if I genuinely believe that, like, everyone kind of at the top was uh, not clean, then, yeah, I'd, I think I would struggle to kind of get out of bed every day in the hope of, like, becoming one of the world's best because it would almost feel impossible. Um but I feel like because I've had kind of glimpses of like what it's like to be at the top, I know you can be at the top in short course. I've never obviously competed in middle distance or long course, but um, I know I know that you can get there clean and I kind of am pursuing, at the end of the day, I'm pursuing my own ambitions in the sport. And uh, yeah, I guess if I obsess over kind of everything that's going on around me at the moment, I think I'd probably go a bit crazy. So uh yeah i'm probably brainwashing myself a bit into thinking that like the sport is clean because i guess it keeps me sane but uh i guess yeah i think max and i definitely differ on that subject i i, I look to a certain extent i do it as well like if you if you're thinking about all the time you're not going to get out of bed you're going to be unmotivated to race i guess to me it's kind of a different motivation it's the fact that i'll show you i can do it clean you know what i mean and that's not saying like Alex is clean. House is clean. All these guys that are at the top, Natty, I'm 100%. But I think it's just naive to think that everyone is. And that's that's a different conversation to me sitting here saying, everyone's dirty. This is impossible to do Natty. It is possible to do Natty. But does that mean there's a few guys in the top 10, top 15, top 20 that aren't? That's a different conversation. And I think the more athletes start saying, look, like that's not normal, right? the more positive 
the more of a positive impact it will have on the sport. Because if you bury your head in the sand and just think, oh no, everything's rosy, everything's perfect. Like, what are you achieving? Like when, when, when someone has a, a progression that is unbelievable, when someone looks like the incredible Hulk at the finish line, like veins popping out their shoulders, veins there that used to be skinny a few years ago. You know, if you don't say these things to the relevant authorities, then you're kind of failing your duty to everybody else that's clean. In my opinion, that's how I see it. And obviously I don't, I don't spend loads of time thinking about it. Although this year it's been hard to kind of shy away. And I think I was naive as well when Colin popped, I was, that was kind of like lights on. And then ever since then it's been, I think it's been in every male athlete's mind and females. I'm not saying it hasn't, but I agree with Kate. And I think the females is a lot more clean and transparent, not saying that everyone is, but I think in the men, you see a lot more, questionable performances look i don't want to i don't want to end on that that uh, low point i, I want to sort of take it up to a bit of a positive before we wrap things up kate I, I said at the start it's been a wild year for you um you know literally some incredible results if you like look back on the year have, have you is it is it how do you feel about it? are you content do you wish there was more like if you could have told yourself 12 months ago that this is where you'd be in October this year, like what do you think you would have believed it? Do you think you would have taken it? Like how do you retro retroactively look back over the last 12 months? I feel like I've definitely grown a lot as an athlete. That sounds like really cliche, but uh, like joining this squad kind of forced me to mature a lot. Um, I'm training with like girls that are a few years older than me and um yeah, it's definitely forced me to kind of mature in my everyday life and training approach. Um, but also like it has, like I've definitely ended this year on a high and like it's by far been like my most successful year uh, to date. Um, but like it definitely didn't start that way. I started my year with 32nd at Abu Dhabi WTS and I really thought, oh, what the hell have I done? I've moved to this squad. Like, I've t like I, I obviously kind of had to, tell my federation what I was doing and why I wanted to move to this squad. And then I started my year with that result. And I literally just wanted to disappear into the ground when I crossed the finish line. Cause I was like, how am I going to keep telling the federation that this was a good idea and I've made a good decision. So um, yeah, it's definitely been kind of a bit of a turbulent year in terms of that, but yeah, I definitely kind of got into the swing of things with the squad. And um, I think that's why it's taken me a while to kind of, uh, get the ball rolling and stuff and uh, like finally like it's not until October that I'm really kind of shown like I guess what I'm capable of and what I've been showing in training just because it's taken a while to like get used to this new uh, life we have um, living abroad living out of a suitcase but uh, yeah I definitely look very fondly back at this year uh, I've taken a lot of confidence from it and I I hope that it's just kind of the beginning of my um yeah my career in short course and Max instead of that question to you I'm going to ask what are you excited about over the next 12 months what are the what are the opportunities you see for yourself to get you excited about the sport uh I'm excited about just every race I get to do really like I I can do world series now I can, you know, I'm still a part of the Super League series. That's going to be amazing next year. We've had some info. I don't know if I'm allowed to share. Probably not at this moment. <laughs> <I think>. no. <laughs> uh, we know but it, but like, we, we better wait until they yeah. say it publicly. But... Sorry, guys. Tune in for more. Uh, that is going to be super exciting, and I think that's going to really push short course in the right direction. Uh, and I'm just excited. Like, we're in a hotel room in in japan after spending a couple of days in saudi and being in girona like two weeks ago so uh just waking up every morning and realizing we're extremely fortunate and we're extremely grateful to live this life and and keep creating more opportunities for ourselves i love it well guys look thank you so much for joining us uh, on this week's show uh we'll go we'll go kate then max give us your social media where people can find you and then we'll wrap it up uh my instagram is kate underscore underscore waff yep max find me online instagram max underscore stapley and uh that's it i don't have x i don't i have threads but i don't use it so whatever strava Stra max stapley and uh linkedin max there you go. <laughs> LinkedIn. you're probably the only person that's come on and plugged their linkedin on the podcast up with some more fruitful financial opportunities on <laughs> 
guys okay. thank you promote my linkedin now as well i have linkedin came there, on. We, there we go there we go guys if you want to look for if you want to give either of them a professional job recommendation you can find <laughs> them on linkedin now and do it thank you both so much for joining us it's uh great to have you on and good luck uh for uh the next 12 months thanks yes. tim Bye. see you in thailand, see you in thailand. Oh, yeah. welcome back james bale well, you... fuck me, mate. That was a good interview. And funnily enough, I did actually listen to it before we released actually. it this week. I listened to it in bed this morning while I was good. dozing away and waking up. And it was really, really good. I liked how candid they both were about certain things that are happening in the sport at the moment. Topics that we've talked about and things that we've discussed many times on this podcast about what it's like to be a fan of this sport, how you're treated as a fan of this sport, how you're treated as an athlete by federations. It was it was a really interesting um, journey. I enjoyed that. I really, again, I, I know Max and Kate quite well now. I've spent a fair bit of time with them recently. And yeah, I, I, I think it shows that the frustrations we have are felt within the sport. This is not a two people sitting on the outside going, like, you know, old man yelling at the clouds. You, you can feel the frustrations. And, and, I, and I think the point that Max made, right, is I, I really do agree that short course triathlon is in trouble. Like I'm, I am... I have switched focus from saying that I think the, the long distance is in trouble to this year. I think, I think world triathlon is making itself irrelevant really. Like I, I really do. And I think that they need to understand that the Olympics isn't the carrot that it used to be because they, they've created an ecosystem, which is unsustainable. Oh, and- totally. It's, it's like, it's like um, it's moving into the realm that triathlon is triathlon, not triathlon. Fucking hell. We're in triathlon, aren't we? Yeah. It's moving into the realm. We're that, talking uh, triathlon, cycling. James. Come on, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Cause cycling is, is, the Olympics in cycling isn't the carrot. The carrot is is the pro side of the sport where you make a huge amount of money, not a huge amount of money, but you can make a huge amount of money as a very competitive professional cyclist. The Olympics is a hell of a thing to get, a hell of a medal to have, but it isn't the be all and end all of a professional cyclist career. And that is the direction that if the PTO have their way and this new Ironman series have their way, that's the direction that triathlon is going to go. You're going to have people prioritizing the longevity of their financial careers over sacrificing that simply for a, for a gold medal or a silver medal, or even a, a 10th place at the Olympics. Yeah. Like on, honestly, I think that it is, yeah, I just can't, the, the it is, the, the pay-per-view thing just baffles me. The broadcast is, we need to see, yeah, yeah. genuinely, if you're listening while triumph, and I know you try, and I know you have the best interest of the sport at heart, you need to overhaul it. Get rid of the net, get rid of the racing for your country. Bring in commercial support. Teams, man. I, I'd love, I still, yeah, upgrade your broadcast for fuck's sake. Get some proper commentators on or, it. Or just go back to be the governing body and find an organization who can actually put on the events for you. I know that they're losing venues. I'm not sure. I don't know where we're going to see WTCS races. It's left the UK. I've heard it's leaving Hamburg. Like there's, there's, uh, I, I just, it's, it's, if you cannot honestly understand that you are making yourself irrelevant, you don't deserve to be the governing body for this, this sport. Like things need to change. And look, mm. they, they seem to show progress yeah, because yeah. They've, they've partnered with the PTO for the middle distance stuff. That's cool. Do something similar. Partner with Super League. Partner with Super League. Let Super League run your short course. That's that. There we go. That's the pathway forward. Yeah, maybe the broadcast element of it. Not no. That's what I mean. Maybe, the, maybe, not, not the logistics. I'm side. not saying make you yeah, fucking listen to our bonus episode if you want to know more about that. Um, I'm not saying necessarily make short course Super League, but like, I just I mean I I can't. I want Look, to see. We we both we teams. both know that this sport needs. At the moment, they are clinging on to that. And if, like you say, if no one within that organization has got the foresight or the ability to see that the Olympics isn't going to be that carrot for much longer, then they need they need to really reassess who they've got looking at their forward planning. You know, pay us enough money, we'll come do it for you. I mean, look, guys, I'll do it if I have to. I'll add it to my many okay. list of things yeah. I do. I'll save the sport. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. I get it. We cost, we cost a lot, but we're worth it. <laughs> Now but, I think we've been we've been fairly negative throughout this. Yeah. Um. I I want to add a little positive in at the end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because friend of the friend of the show, Aiden Wild has announced that he's racing uh, seventy point three Melbourne on the twelfth of November with a uh, intention of getting a seventy point three world slot. Dude, he said this on the podcast that I did with him. Oh, did he? I didn't fucking listen. <laughs> Honestly, didn't listen. I've just seen that on the news and been like, I've got a scoop. 
<laughs> he literally said this on the interview at the chat I had with him. Ah, oh, fuck it. I don't, I don't listen to interviews you do unless I, I was, you ask me to. I was going to say positive, like, uh, positive things. Like genuinely, genuinely, I think uh, Kate Woff is a soup, like a future star of the sport. Like really, really watch yeah, this space. And Max is such, a, I also think, has an extremely bright fear. He hasn't got a world title yet and he didn't win Super League this year. But they like those sort of people are very good for triathlon. And I see that younger generation of athletes like them and it makes me extremely optimistic. Uh, I also find it interesting that they're both very much, I don't know if they said, it, it, they're not like we're just focused on WTCS. They are already talking about sort of going between the middle distance, the PTO style. It is it is an exciting time, I think, in that regard. So I think that the future is bright, mate. And uh, I, I, I would encourage you all to go on and start supporting those two athletes because I think they are, they are a very, very bright, spark in the sport of triathlon at the moment so agreed and to and to buttress something i said on the bonus episode i think the future is bright Mm. because as opposed to what was happening in pro cycling back in the bad old days the reaction of the sport as a whole has given me real faith in what we are part of because there hasn't just been a silent sort of roll of the eyes and a and a, and a shrug of the shoulders. There has been a sport-wide condemnation of any rumblings we've heard. And like you say, there isn't a huge amount of support for the idea of dopers in triathlon mm. from anywhere I can see within the sport. And uh, and it's and it's visceral. And uh, and that is a good thing to see. Yeah. Look, again, we're wrapping up now. So uh, thank you guys for listening. But yeah, patreon.com, our bonus episode we record on Tuesday, we, we go through behind the scenes at Malibu. Uh, we give some, I guess, more candid thoughts about uh, Ironman Women's World Championships in Nice. Uh, I guess more of the performances we thought were a bit shit uh, and some of the things we probably couldn't say so vocally. And then we do talk a bit more candidly about the Sam Lee thing. Uh, the feedback's been really good, uh, I think. And we know that when we did the same thing about uh, Nice, we had a, you know we had like 40 sign-ups. So if you guys do want to get a bit more, I guess, <laughs> the things were a bit like less nerve, more nerve, you know, the things we didn't say about what's happened this week, uh, patreon.com slash talking triathlon is where you can get it. Uh, literally it's, it's just all the money we make goes back in the show. So it helps us to do this podcast. Uh, you can also head to youtube.com. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's growing. We love it. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's almost doubled since we changed the name audience has doubled since we changed the name. So rebranding was a good idea. Um, it really Jimbo, was it really was you can do your little join the later. patreon group yeah thanks for listening to talking triathlon if you want to support the show jump on at patreon.com forward slash talking triathlon if you want to follow tim he's at tford14 in insta and i'm at bail.james85 on instagram find us across all social networks at talking triathlon on insta and at talk triathlon on twitter if you join the patreon group you'll get access to the monthly bonus episode and the social group and the whatsapp group and you'll get basically get direct access to our thoughts whenever you want them, as long as we're awake. Yeah, that was that was where I got most of the opinions about the same thing. I think it was straight in that WhatsApp group. So uh, yeah. yeah, Jimbo, a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, guys. A pleasure as always. We'll talk to you next week. Cheerio.